To me, a bridge connects people. It connects commerce, it connects neighborhoods. I feel like it's the tissue that brings people together across neighborhoods. The drawbridges on the Ship Canal are a really special part of Seattle because Seattle is all about its waterways. I think the Ship Canal bridges are a treasure that the citizens of Seattle appreciate. They help define the communities. They're, they're named after the communities that they serve, and they're an amazing asset that people enjoy. The process of using those bridges, hearing that bell ring, having to stop your car, seeing people get off their bicycles and wait, sitting there as people turn their cars off and watching the bridges move to let maritime traffic through is one of the really charming and I think unifying uh, aspects of living in Seattle. If you live here, you have that experience no matter what. The Lake Washington Ship Canal connects Lake Washington with Puget Sound via Lake Union and Salmon Bay. And it was built in 1916, 1917, but it was actually an idea that began all the way back in the 1850s. Thomas Mercer believed that if Seattle was going to really become the city that they envisioned it would be, they needed to be able to move traffic between the saltwater and the freshwater. So when they decided to build the Lake Washington Ship Canal, it basically bisected the city right at its north end. And so in order to move people between the two parts of the city, they needed to build bridges. There's five low drawbridges across the Ship Canal. The furthest west one is the Great Northern Railroad Bridge. The next one is the Ballard Bridge, followed um, going eastward toward the Fremont Bridge, and then the University Bridge, and then you get to the Montlake Bridge. In the early 1900s, when Seattle was first looking at different ways of crossing the Ship Canal, they know they were going to be forced into having a movable bridge so they can get it out of the way for vessels. There's three types of standard movable bridges, such as the lift bridge, where you have tall towers that support the lift mechanisms and the roadway will actually rise vertically. A swing bridge is another option, and Seattle has an example of a swing bridge on the Duwamish Waterway. The third type, which is what we have on the Ship Canal, is commonly referred to as a Chicago-style fixed trunnion bascule bridge. So this bridge is like a teeter-totter. On the teeter-totter, there's always a hinge in the middle. There's got to be something, a hinge there, right? That's what this is in this room here. This is the trunnion. Here's the rest of our hinge right here. That's the outside portion. And that's what the bridge is actually sitting on. And when that bridge opens, there's a pinion gear down here. That pinion gear walks along these teeth here and it drags that bridge open. This is the counterweight. And again, if we open this bridge up, we would end up lying on our backs down there on this thing, because this, this moves down into the pit. This is bridge four for the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad. It's different from the other bridges that you'll find on the Ship Canal. It's the only rail bridge on the Ship Canal, and it's sometimes referred to as the Great Northern Bridge. James J. Hill was president of the Great Northern Railway, and he was bringing a lot of wheat and other products down from Canada, and he was shipping them out to Seattle and overseas to Asia. Before they built the ship canal, the Great Northern had a trestle up on 14th Avenue in Ballard, and that was how they got their trains in and out of Inner Bay. But when they brought on the ship canal, they had a lot of large ships coming in and out of the locks. So this bridge was built to accommodate those large ships. It's got a 500-ton counterweight made out of cast concrete. And there was a symbol on the Ballard side of the bridge of a goat, and the goat was a symbol in the early 20s of the Great Northern. Back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, there was a small depot right on the other side of Ballard. It was the Ballard Depot, sometimes called Snooze Junction. The depot still exists. It's now a private house, but it's still part of a big railroad history of the Great Northern Railroad here in Seattle. 
The bridge is 100 years old, and they now handle about 30 trains a day. You might see Amtrak going across. You might see mixed freight going up to Canada. And so this is an integrated part that the railroad relies on to ship freight all over the United States. Ballard was not part of Seattle until 1907, and the first bridges that connected Ballard to Seattle were built in the 1890s. And of course, Ballard was very Scandinavian, and uh, fishing people came from Norway and Sweden and so on. So it became a big fishing community, but also lumber shingles were huge in Ballard. The Ballard Bridge was built in 1917, not exactly the Ballard Bridge you see today, because the original bridge had wooden trestles. In the 1930s, they were rotting, they were a tremendous fire hazard, and finally the bridge was rebuilt uh, with help from the Works Progress Administration, the federal entity that was created during the Depression. And so the concrete piers that you see now and the steel approaches were built in 1940. The Ballard Bridge connects Ballard to Fisherman's Terminal, which was built in 1914. Fisherman's Terminal is the dock for the North Pacific fishing fleet, which is actually quite important to the economy of Seattle to this day. The Ballard Bridge is a big hunk of a bridge, and it's very impressive. Both the Ballard and Fremont Bridges were open in 1917. We get people from all over the world to come see the Fremont Bridge. We hear the Fremont Bridge has had more openings than any other bridge in all of the United States. And as far as we know, that's a true statement. Because it's close to the water surface and we have a very robust marine community here, the bridge opens over 5,000 times a year. So it's had about 800,000 openings since it was built. And that's a lot of openings. The Fremont got a reputation for being kind of wacky, kind of funky, and people who really resided in this neighborhood, these adjacent neighborhoods for a long time, had a lot of stories. And I remember hearing from an elderly woman about her being a young woman, and before there was like a lot of safety and regulation, she and her friends would ride the bridge when it was going up the, on the underside, and they had ways of crawling up there and like holding onto the girders and actually riding it. So that was a great story. The bridge is blue and orange. And I think it just speaks volumes to the spirit of Seattle that we're willing to paint our 100-year-old bridges these really bright, vibrant colors. To me, it speaks to the spirit of creativity and innovation that make this city a great place. The University Bridge was built in 1919, and the opening ceremonies were a big, big deal for the city of Seattle but not just because the bridge was opening. It was very soon after the end of World War I. Many of the Seattleites who had fought in World War I were returning to the city. So Seattle used this as an opportunity not only to celebrate the new bridge, but also to welcome these soldiers back to Seattle. The University Bridge served Seattle quite well from 1919, but by the 1930s, automobiles were much more predominant and the University Bridge needed to be widened and in 1933 there were ceremonies to reopen the bridge. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt opened the bridge by pressing a telegraph signal um, in Washington DC and when that signal came here to Seattle that was the sign to open the bridge. When people are driving across the University Bridge, they might look down and they might wonder about the community that surrounds it. One of the really unique features of this neighborhood is that we have houseboats. The houseboats in Seattle were so popular in the early 1900s, there were something like a thousand houseboats throughout the entire city. And the area here near the University Bridge is one of the few remaining floating home communities. The Mount Lake Bridge was built in 1925. It was the last bridge built on the Lake Washington Ship Canal. 
And the reason it took so long is that they couldn't get funding for it. They had multiple votes where they couldn't get funding for it. It took five tries. One of the key reasons that they wanted to be able to get people across the canal at Montlake was because Husky Stadium, which was built in 1920, was just right across the cut from all the residential areas that extend to the south in Capitol Hill and Madison Park. So the bond when it passed was largely due to the efforts of the athletics director at the UW. His name was Darwin Meisness, and he just really wanted to see that bond issue pass and that bridge get built to facilitate people getting to the university. They finally got the bridge to open and it's been used extensively for the Husky football games ever since. The bridge is designed in the collegiate gothic style, which complements the collegiate gothic style buildings of the university campus. The Vasco bridges of Ballard, Fremont, University, and Montlake, they were designed to last about 50 years. They're gonna turn 100 years old in one more year. So they've lasted long beyond their intended useful life. And that's because the public has entrusted us the necessary dollars to maintain them well. So here it is 2016 in Seattle. Seattle is experiencing a lot of rapid growth, a lot of building, and we can learn from the past and how they thought ahead. When they put in the railroad bridges, the locks, and the bridges on up into Ballard, they were thinking ahead about the growth that was going to occur and they accommodated that into their design. And so today, we should do the same thing as we look ahead into the future. I love these bridges. I think the canal and the bridges form a really important part of Seattle's identity. When you have to stop for the bridge and you turn off your engine, you get to roll down your window and you get to hear the sound of the boats and the sound of the water and often the sound of the seagulls. And you almost always get to see some sort of cool boat. When else are you going to take the time to go and look at those boats? It's kind of like they just put them on parade for you. I think the bridges of the Ship Canal are beautiful because they are simple and they do a really clear job and they do it elegantly.